my brother. He, <laughs> wow. That's unbelievable. I had no idea. During the Depression, the guest aunt began acquiring vases from Tiffany's, possibly ordering them by the crate load. The appraiser noted the rarity of the crate with glass plastered on its sides and highlighted the significance of keeping shipping crates, which is uncommon. One piece of pastel glass, produced in the 20s, stood out among the collection. The appraiser discussed a paperweight glass vase costing $12,000 in R&D. Notably, the guest vase was labeled as an exhibition piece, possibly from 1915. The appraiser compared the guest vase to one at the Met in New York, indicating its potential value and rarity. In a retail setting, the crate alone could be valued between five to ten thousand dollars, while the glass vase could retail for two to three thousand dollars. However, the guest unique vase could fetch anywhere from fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars. Additionally, the appraiser discussed a Tiffany lava vase mentioning its rarity and potential value between $100,000 and $150,000. Where is my brother? <laughs> wow, that's unbelievable. I had no idea. The guest received this guitar as a gift from his uncle during a family trip to Texas. It was purchased by the owner's aunt for $200 in 1928. The guest uncle gifted him this guitar on the condition that he had to play it. Did you play professionally and play? A, a little bit, a little bit. Wow. What kind of music did you play with it? Mostly folk. It's a Gibson style O guitar, manufactured by the Gibson Company in 1922. The guitar has a label and it features a unique, wide, and broad design. This guitar has a truss rod, making it easier and more comfortable to play. The company upgraded the tailpiece to modernize it. Being a modern guitar of its era, what could its value be? So it's 7000 including the case. Yes, this thing would bring wow. $7,000 at retail today. Nice, nice. These photographs not only hold memories, but also serves as glimpses into the past. They were taken when the guest himself was a kid from a family member who liked to collect stuff. They thought the pictures might have been taken by a guy named Andrew J. Russell during the Civil War. The pictures were stuck onto pages in an old book, but later someone took them off to keep them safe. In these pictures, we have City Point, which served as a pivotal hub for the transshipment of supplies along the East Coast, particularly heading southward. A striking scene unfolds with a Union gunboat on the deck. Another captivating view depicts a camp scene from City Point, Virginia, offering a glimpse of the theater of war in Virginia through the lens of pine trees. The paper they were printed on was mentioned because it showed they were probably made after the Civil War. However, if they were made during the Civil War, they could be worth more money. But because they were made after, they're worth about $500 each. Even though they're not super valuable individually, altogether they could be worth around $15,000, which was a big surprise to everyone. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm very surprised. guest came with a Pearpoint Puffy Owl Lamp. She got it from her mother. She got it in the 60s from Carol Ferranti. Carol Ferranti was a very well-known dealer in New York City. There's a little diamond-shaped signature with a P in the middle, signed for the Pearpoint Company. Pearpoint originally made a lot of silver-plated metalware. This unbelievable owl is perched on a branch ready to pounce on its prey. A little ominous, but beautifully rendered, the base is compromised of an owl sculptural owl form. The owl lamp appraised for twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. The guest came with Schneider and Company Derringers. He got these Derringers from his father. These are desirable because they're a southern made Derringer. They have the distinctive shape of the trigger guard as well as the shape of the grip. At the top of the barrel is Schneider and Company Memphis, Tennessee. These are both nice and complete fully functional guns a pair that appraised for $10,000. No kidding. The guest came with rose-cut diamond jewelry. She inherited it from a wealthy Dutch aunt. Pearls were her wedding jewelry, and the others were antique diamonds. The jewelry includes a necklace, bracelet, brooch, earrings, and a ring. All the pieces are set with diamonds, typically found in Holland. 
These are not antiques. These were done in the 1950s and locally appraised for around $8,000. Now they are appraised between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 as diamond prices have increased. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my. The guest brought a furniture made by Thomas Molesworth. Thomas Molesworth, known as one of the best furniture makers of the 20th century, created the furniture for the guest father in 1933. Using Douglas fir wood and incorporating burling, which adds significant value, the appraiser highlighted the mining motif on one of the tables. I love the mining motif on top. The pick, the shovel, and the gold pan, it's so Molesworth. The top of the table is made out of dyed green leather. While the furniture is in good condition overall, the fabric has been redone, which can affect its value. The guest revealed owning about 40 pieces of the Annenberg collection, including tables, lamps, and beds, out of approximately 250 pieces. At auction, the collection is to be worth around $100,000 to $120,000. The appraiser praised the design of the lamp from the collection, noting its early design and unique pulls, estimating its value at auction to be between forty dollars and $60,000. I love those numbers. <laughs> Thank sure you. you do. It's, uh... Guest shared her connection to the painting, explaining how she fell in love with it almost 50 years ago because it reminded her of Joaquin Sorolla's work. The appraiser provided background information on the artist, Jane Peterson, noting her study with Sorolla in Spain, and her association with Louis Comfort Tiffany, which influenced her colorful and expressive style. Jane Peterson, originally from Elgin, Illinois, studied in New York and later traveled to Paris. The painting titled The Answer was exhibited with the Allied Artist of America in 1929. The guest and appraiser discussed the painting's subject, speculating about the meaning behind the woman's pensive expression and broken beads. The painting is in excellent condition, being oil on canvas and unlined, and the guest purchased it unframed for $150. In the current market, the painting is estimated to be worth around $300,000. Where's the chair? <laughs> now I need that chair. This is a timeless piece by the artist Albrecht Durer. Acquired by the guest for $400 over 30 years ago, this is the real deal. The artist Albrecht Durer worked in South Germany and was one of the most famous early Renaissance printmakers. Durer was born in 1471 in Nuremberg, worked there his whole life. He died in 1528. He was a child prodigy. He made approximately 300 different woodcuts, which is what we have here. This is one of 15 different woodcut subjects he made to illustrate what's known as the Apocalypse. The title of this work is St. John Appearing Before God the Father. The woodcut is part of the Apocalypse series, which he made in the mid-1400s. For a piece so old, it was preserved perfectly. However, at auction, this beauty would sell for... $30,000. Whoa! Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm glad I put a nice frame on it. <laughs> Take a look at this magnificent Hispanol Moresque Varguino Tequillan. The guest got it at auction in Norfolk, Virginia. It actually originally came two owners ago from an estate in England. It was a vice president for Liberties of London, the fabric design house. It passed to his daughter, who brought it to the United States. Then when her stuff was auctioned, I picked it up at the auction. Initially, these were really desk, writing desk made in Spain. They were popular in the 15th century, 16th century, 17th century, and 18th century. When I call it Hispaniel, because it's from Spain, but then we go to the Moresque, and that's the decoration on it. Looking at the whole piece together. This would have been your fold down writing surface, which has amazing tooled leather on it. Very beautiful. And then all of these cubby holes. It also has handles on the side so that it's able to be carried around. That's a chest of drawers that these desks sat upon. As an old piece, it has been restored a couple of times. A piece like this was made for that market in that style in Spain in the 18th century. At auction today, it would be worth around. $10,000 to $15,000 range. Okay, great. Yeah. Wow. We have 
have here an astonishing painting by Jay Hauser, which was inherited from the guest in-laws, who probably got it at auction. John Hauser was a Cincinnati artist. Okay. And he actually went to Germany to study art in Munich, which was a city where many American artists went. Uh -huh. And he went with his fellow Cincinnati artist, Joseph Henry Sharp, who would also become a very renowned uh -huh. Western artist. And Hauser was well known for doing portraits of Native American Indian chiefs. The painting is of Joe Black Fox, who's a member of the Sioux tribe. The headdress that he's wearing tells us that he was renowned for his warrior exploits. It's a very attractive oil painting on board, which is fairly typical for the artist. This piece is dated around 1900, and at auction, it would sell for. A $7,000 to $10,000 estimate. Oh, wow. Wow. That's nice to know. Thank you. This is an East Lake style chair, which is an American or European interpretation of aesthetic movement design. You can tell by the way the back is carved, this ebonized finish. It's probably oak or walnut, but a really good period piece from the fourth quarter of the 19th century. The chair is a combination of machined and hand finished. I would guess the larger parts are, are machined to some extent, but the detailing would be chip carved or carved by hand. Talking about the beautiful fabric, across this fabric and I brought it back and I, and I gave it to the upholster and uh, he had never done it like with fabric like this and I had never done it at all so it was an experiment. He got exactly what I was aiming it's for. Really nice job. Yeah. It's a beautiful chair, ecologically sound and a very small carbon footprint repurposing an old piece of furniture. At auction, the set, both the chair and ottoman would sell for $2,000 set to me if anybody was buying new furniture. That seems like a fairish price. This footstool is Duncan Fife from the first third of the 19th century. At auction, it would sell for... I'd say $500. The guest recounted acquiring a bracelet from a state auction in Florida, believing it to be part of Johnny Weissmuller's collection. The bracelet from the 1940s was popular due to its wearable style. The piece was made during World War II when materials were scarce. The design featured yellow gold baton and green gold pyramid links along with motifs of the war. The guests purchased it for $1,500. The appraiser estimated its value to be... $15,000 to $18,000. Oh, really? That's what this piece would bring. Well, it certainly has improved in value. The guest inherited the ring from her mother-in-law, who received it from her aunt in Chicago. It's likely to be purchased in the 1920s. She treasures it, especially the iron part. The appraiser identified the ring as Marsh Jewelry, named after the store Marsh's in San Francisco. Founded by George Turner Marsh in 1876, this piece is from the late 1940s or early 50s and is made of oxidized steel. To test for steel, the appraiser used a magnet, noting that gold wouldn't be attracted to it. Marsh often added diamonds to the sides of the ring, along with other elements like pearl, coral, and jade, with jade being one of the rarest. Although the ring is not signed, its form and design are characteristic of Marsh jewelry. Similar rings sell for around 7500 in today's market, far exceeding the initial estimate of $350. Well, I, I have worn it and enjoyed it, and I will continue to do that. Guest shared that the photograph has been in his wife's family for over 60 years. It depicts over 1,000 military personnel at the Great Lakes Training Center creating an American flag, a remarkable feat. The appraiser noted that the Mayhart Studio in Chicago took the photograph in 1917, a significant year as the United States entered World War I in April of that year. The concept of a living flag, where individuals create a flag formation, was popular around this time. Photographers, like the Mayhart Studio, would plan extensively for such photos. With someone likely standing on a tower with a megaphone to organize the participants, each individual in the photo is seen standing at attention and saluting, adding to the authenticity of the image. The appraiser explained that images like these, depicting patriotic symbols, were common during this era. If the photograph were to be auctioned, its estimated value would be between fifteen to $2,500. I appreciate that because it does have sentimental value to even to us about four generations later. <laughs> the guest brought two cases, 
one acquired from an auction in Chicago and the other from an auction in Indianapolis, believing they could be a pair. The vases were crafted by Gorham Martelli, known for his fine silver craftsmanship. The appraiser identified marks on each vase, indicating they were retailed by Spalding. You can see the marks. It says Gorham Martelli. Martelli silver had a higher standard than traditional sterling silver. The pieces featured wonderful hand-hammered rims and intricate floral decorations. Which continues down the body, this fabulous leaf which stretches around it to this wonderful scalloped, almost Art Nouveau style. They were dated around 1904, as confirmed by the marks. Despite slight variations due to hand craftsmanship, they were considered a rare find. How much would the item be valued? Twelve and eighteen thousand dollars for the pair. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. The guest expressed her love for Russian items, considering Russian artists among the best. She purchased the bronze sculpture in 1975 from an antique shop in Germany. The appraiser noted that the sculpture depicts a Russian Cossack and is likely made before the revolution, agreeing with the guest assessment. Yevgeny Naps is the artist of the sculpture, who worked in a circle of sculptors. Little is known about Naps individually, but he was part of a school of artists creating these types of bronzes. The sculpture bears the Warful Foundry mark, indicating that it was cast between the 1870s and 1890s. Despite the limited information on the artist, the sculpture is praised for its energy, expression, and naturalistic base. The guest purchased the sculpture for $270, and its estimated value at auction is between eight dollars to $10,000. It was not that 